The Atlantic called him a Timothy Leary of the viral video age. He has also been described as the new Carl Sagan, an idea DJ, and part Timothy Leary, part Ray Kurzweil, and part Neo from The Matrix. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome TV personality, techno philosopher, TED speaker, and your host, Jason Silva. Thank you. What's up, everyone? Wow, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you guys. The true architects of the future. Wow, I got to tell you, I am so psyched. And I'm going to tell you several reasons why. But first, since you're going to see me a lot for the next four days, let me tell you just a little bit about who I am. So I was born in Venezuela. I earned a degree from the University of Miami in film and philosophy, which means I'm not an IT guy, but I am absolutely in love with technology. And after a few years hosting a television show for Al Gore's current TV network, I decided to create my own short-form video content contemplating big ideas related to creativity and innovation and philosophy, and specifically the ongoing co-evolution of humans and technology. And that's what I love about conferences like this, because I think you know, technology is evolving so fast, exponentially so, in fact, and we're so swept up in it and our expectations are so high, yet very few people ever step back and go, wow, Look at the big picture and think big. I mean, do you guys realize what's going on here? This is accelerated evolution. You know, the world is hyper-connected all the time, in real time. We are engineering computation. We're extending sensors into everything. Our cars, our electric meters, shipping crates, in planes, on bridges. At this year's TED conference, Chris Anderson, the founder and visionary behind TED, put it this way. The computing power and some of the things that we're seeing is really startling. We're used to Moore's law. We're used to things getting better and better and better. And then some years, it suddenly just feels as if, kapow, there's a step change. You know, there's a techno tsunami going on, an unprecedented convergence of big data, analytics, social, mobile, cloud. It wasn't that long ago that mobile phones were a cool gadget owned by the techno elite. Now they're ubiquitous. We got seven billion people. We got six billion devices. The amount of data that we create every day used to be mind-boggling to us, yet we've quickly become immune to the fact that 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years alone. And it's not just the pre kapow kind of data that could be kept within corporate walls. It's all that unstructured content, most of which didn't even exist 10 years ago. Documents, tweets, images, videos posted to YouTube, data gathered from surveillance cameras. We post, we blog, we share, we tweet, we like or don't like. We have a voice and we leave a digital trail. And every tweet we send is being followed, monitored, analyzed, acted on. Companies are analyzing social to find out what you're thinking, to know what new products and services you want, even before you do. And a new initiative by the UN is actually using sentiment analysis to help predict civil unrest, job losses, spending reductions, disease outbreaks. The ability to visualize all of this information is taking human understanding to an unprecedented level. We can see patterns we could never see before. We can spot trends as they're happening. We can predict future trends and we can test hypotheses. You know, technology is an evolutionary force slingshotting the species forward as ever before. We are fast approaching, I believe, a new renaissance, an age of wonder and radical possibility. And what's most exciting about this new renaissance is that to be a part of it, to be one of the truly enlightened ones, all you got to do is think big. Step outside your comfort zone. Look at things from a new perspective. Maybe even take Donald Trump's advice. As long as you're going to be thinking anyway, why not think big? Consider these thoughts by futurist Kevin Kelly. Can you imagine how poor our world would be if Bach had been born a thousand years before the Flemish invented the technology of the harpsichord? Or Vincent van Gogh had arrived 5,000 years before we invented the technology of cheap oil paint? What kind of modern world would we have if Edison, Green, and Dixon had not developed cinematic technology before Hitchcock grew up? And I say, can you imagine a future where we have all these capabilities to derive incredible insights, but never took advantage of it? because we were unable to truly think big. 
As Alan Harrington wrote in The Immortalist, we must never forget we are cosmic revolutionaries, not stooges conscripted to advance a natural order that kills everyone. And he's exactly right. We are the species that transcends its limitations. Our function is to expand our boundaries and extend our reach. Our function is to engage in new thinking, outside of the box thinking, to think big. And you know, this seismic shift toward data-driven discovery and decision-making is a revolution. And what makes me so psyched about being here at a conference like this with you guys is that you play such a critical role in this seismic shift. You are leading this revolution. You are the architects of this future. Andrew Gelman, the statistician and political scientist at Columbia University, put it this way. Veteran data analysts used to bore their friends with discussions of their work, but now their friends are eating it up. The culture has changed, he says. There is this idea that numbers and statistics are interesting and fun. It's cool now. Your work is so important. It's exciting. It's impactful. It's cool now. And when you look at what this revolution has made possible, you know, that's when it gets really exciting. What was once only imagined is now inevitable. And the opportunities for those who think bigger and brighter are huge. We live in an age of empowered imagination. This ability to conjure up delightful future possibilities, pick the most amazing one, and then pull the present forward to meet that possibility. That is what we do. Big data, social, mobile, and cloud, when taken together, offer game-changing opportunities. We really get to reinvent the wheel here, my friends. Installing sensors all over the world means we are creating a global nervous system. The sensors are the nerve endings of a global organism, of a global brain. And making sense of the input signals, the behaviors and effects of these billions of minds interacting and interfacing with each other and with the larger system is literally offering consciousness expanding information that is transforming Transforming our understanding of ourselves and offering insights that will transform how the world is run. And by nurturing these spaces of data transparency where ideas and information can intermingle, mutate, evolve, where ideas can essentially procreate, will lead to even more breakthroughs. And you know, there's a term used by author Steven Johnson called the adjacent possible that I absolutely love. He offers a sort of shadow future that hovers on the present state of things, he says. The adjacent possible is a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. Now, our increasing ability to quantify ourselves, to measure our behavior on scales we couldn't dream about mere decades ago, reveals not only what is, but also what could be if we do this or that tweak to the system. Now, things are about to get insanely cool, my friends. Today, committed groups of technologists riding the wave of exponential growth can accomplish what only governments could mere decades ago. The tools to change the world are in everybody's hands. You know, we have the tools. All we gotta do is imagine what could be. We can reinvent the present. We can transform the world around us. You know, Sartre said, because we can imagine, we are free. And the guy was certainly onto something. In a recent article in Forbes, Ed Dumbill talks about what it means to have a digital nervous system. And the key trait, he says, is to make an organization's feedback loop entirely digital, a direct connection from sensing and monitoring inputs through to product outputs. He goes on to explain that the reach of the digital nervous system has grown steadily over the past 30 years, and how each step brings gains in agility and flexibility along with an order of magnitude more data. First, from specific application programs, then to general business use with the PC, then direct interaction over the web. Mobile adds awareness of time and place along with instant notification. The next step breaks down data silos and adds storage and elasticity through cloud computing. And now we're integrating smart agents able to act on our behalf. And we're building connections to the real world through sensors and automation. It boggles the mind just to contemplate. Energy companies, because they have real-time data and visibility into the grid, are now detecting problems and fixing them before they happen. Physicians, instead of relying solely on their own personal experience and their own readings of medical journals, are now drawing on the experience of other doctors and vast amounts of data analysis to determine the best treatments. Police departments across the country are using computerized mapping and analysis of variables like historical arrest patterns, paydays, sporting events, rainfall, and holidays to try to predict likely crime hotspots and deploy officers there in advance before the crimes even happen. 
Companies know which of their clients are in danger of churning even before they know themselves. Retailers use sentiment analysis to predict what you want before you do. Fraud is being detected and stopped immediately because we can now see patterns and spending habits and know what's normal and what's not. These are big opportunities to transform businesses and industries and the world we live in. This, my friends, is an upgrade. So looking forward towards this event horizon, as technology continues to bootstrap on its own complexity and the rate of change is itself changing and accelerating, we have evolution evolving its own evolvability, as Kevin Kelly talks about. And now we are using better tools to build even better tools in a sort of self-amplifying feedback loop. And now biology is becoming an information technology too. We are entering an era in which digital data merges with biology. And as we come to master the information processes of biology, this synthesis of codes takes the abstract world of digits and brings it back into the physical world. Here we have software that writes its own hardware. Here the instructions, the data, instantiates itself in the physical universe. We can instruct genes and cells on how to replicate. We could never do that with computers. Physicist Freeman Dyson speaks of a near future where a new generation of artists will write genomes the way that Shakespeare used to write verses. And certainly we'll be able to upgrade our genomes the way that software programmers currently upgrade computer software. But taking all of these ideas at face value, no doubt is broadening your perceptual boundaries, forcing you to reconfigure your mental models in order to accommodate the epic scope of these ideas. Now, this should induce a state of awe, providing a sort of ontological awakening, a realization of the connectedness of all things, and also of the continuum from inanimate to animate matter. All of it is nature, all of it is inevitable, all of it is emerging as part of the same evolutionary process. It's wild, guys. I don't know about you guys, but this stuff blows my mind. And you know, the eminent psychologist Nicholas Humphrey has written of the biological advantage of being awestruck. How fortuitous, he says, for a species to find that its own ability to contemplate, to marvel at its own existence has been evolutionarily advantageous. In other words, this capacity has been biologically selected for because it informs our life with a sense of cosmic significance that makes us actually work harder to persist and to survive and to understand. And you know, a recent study out of Stanford on the subject of awe actually validates this hypothesis. In the study, they define awe as an experience of such perceptual expansion such perceptual vastness that you literally have to reconfigure your mental schemata just to accommodate, just to take in the scale of the experience. It's a download. We've all felt this before. The first time we saw the Grand Canyon, perhaps, or succumbed to the immersive power of an IMAX film. And I propose to you that as we continue this fascinating, addictive, irresistible co-evolution of humans and technology, as we move into this big future, it's going to ignite the awestruck in all of us. And you know, the renowned theoretical physicist, Dr. Michio Kaku, has given us a glimpse into what our collective future might look like. By 2020, he believes the word computer will have effectively vanished from the English language. At the cost of a penny, instead of one chip inside a desktop, we'll have millions of chips in all of our possessions, our furniture, cars, appliances, clothing, in our bodies. We'll simply turn things on. When you need to see a doctor, you'll talk to a wall in your home and an animated, artificially intelligent doctor will appear. You'll scan your body with a handheld MRI machine and you'll receive a diagnosis that is 99% accurate. In this augmented reality, the internet will be in your contact lens. You will blink and go online. Students will look up answers to tests while taking them. Actors will cheat from their scripts while performing on stage. Foreigners will translate their conversations with natives instantly. And you know, the iconic technologist Stuart Brand, who I love, once said, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. In other words, we need to take responsibility for our actions, which increasingly are planetary in scale. We are indeed as gods. Our tools make us so. Big ideas, big opportunities, a big future, and those who think big will win. Now, exploring these big ideas is what this conference is all about. 
And we're going to continue this discussion now with a look at the impact that technology innovations are having on organizations in this new era of computing. And on that note, my friends, please welcome Senior Vice President Middleware Software for IBM Software, Robert LeBlanc. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Hey, much, much better. Hey, thank you for joining us here on behalf of IBM and all of our sponsors. It's great to have you here. In fact, just before I came on this morning, I got told we passed over 12,000 attendees. So congratulations and thank you. 